All right. Hi, this is Phil Cashin. This is the Winner's Circle, episode four of season two. Uh, we have a unique opportunity tonight. We have uh, two shooters on the Winner's Circle. Uh, several weeks ago, we had the MPA Spring Shootout in Swainsboro, Georgia. And it has, has happened several times over the past year or so in the Precision Rifle Series. We've had two shooters who ended up with the same score. Uh, and so we're going to interview both Kale Harmon and Andy Slade tonight. Uh, both of them finished with the same score in the match. Uh, they both uh, they both received 100 PRS points, which typically goes to the winner. Although in this case, Andy was a little bit quicker on the uh, on the skill stage, so he brought home the first place trophy. Uh, and uh, but you know we're going to talk about the match tonight, and just you know just it's kind of an an interesting opportunity, and hopefully, you know, we'll have some good things to talk about. But, but you know, Andy, since you brought home the trophy, congratulations on 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 the first place at the match. That was so. Give me some feedback about the match, and and let's kind of hear some of the details. Yeah, you know, first I'd like to say Kale shot really good, but as we all know, there can only be one winner. So the only reason he's on here is just so that we can. Hey, listen to like how to shoot a KYL because he's definitely kicked my butt on a KYL for the last two years. And I got to figure that out. So other than that, uh, Kale, you suck. And um, we're going to enjoy this conversation for the next few minutes, but yeah, um, no, we had a great time and it, it's a, uh, it's a cool venue down there The I love the family aspect of, of the cool acres facility. Those guys do it right. They're always, you know, the, one of the first things they spent money on was putting bathrooms in, which is something I really appreciate. I think that's super cool. A lot of places you go are immaculate, and they don't even have places to go to the bathroom. So I appreciate that in a, in a venue. I think that's really cool. Um, they, they put on a good match. It's, um, you know, it's Georgia, so it's super flat, really hard to have a lot of angles of fire there or anything. But he does good with what he's got, and – uh, it's well attended by a bunch of good shooters, and, you know, it was a beautiful time of the year. It always rains during that spring, at least it seems that way, during that spring match. And we did get a little bit of that, but we, pretty, we got pretty lucky, I feel like. But overall, enjoyed it, had a great time, and I'm sure we're going to go through some questions about stages and stuff here in a minute. But, you know, it was uh, nothing, nothing crazy or outside of the box. So, anyway, it ended up working out pretty good. Good deal. Excellent. And Kale, congratulations on getting a hundred points and, uh, and your second match this year. So you've, uh, you've been on a nice roll here since, um, probably fall of last year and continuing your great shooting. And, and, uh, so, you know, I know you, you, you guys at the AMU you aren't the fastest shooters out there, but you're really good. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, th this one stung a little. I mean, I'll be honest, this brings like a whole new meaning to first place loser. <laughs> like, you know, like it's a, uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it is, you know what I mean? Especially with the kind of, they didn't have the the new PRS skill stage in there, but it was a variation of it where it's a big small and it does require quite a bit more respect than your average skill stage. Um, and Cool Acres is normally like a left edge type of place, you know what I mean? And I can say this past match definitely wasn't. I mean, we had some conditions there that were pretty spicy. So, I mean, when I shot that skill stage, I definitely slowed it down and gave those targets the respect they deserve. So, I'll just say Andy got a good draw. Maybe he didn't shoot it that fast. <laughs> he just got a good draw on it. But, no, I mean, he shot, shot really well. It is what it is. Like, I had a – I – really need to stop putting myself in a deficit after the first day. Um, I think I would have a little bit more success if I would stop doing that. I put myself in a pretty good hole after the first day. Um, and Andy and quite a few other people were shooting really, really well. So if I'm going to be honest, I was just fortunate to finish where I did. So, you know, it makes it tough when you got a lot of good guys shooting these days, but yeah, I, li I like Eric's match. I think he puts a lot of effort into it and, I think the thing that doesn't go unnoticed by a lot of people is how much he's putting back into the range. Like he's not just running the match, pocketing some change. I mean, it's very visible, you know, all the concrete work he's put in the new props, the facilities, like he's constantly working to kind of 
work with what he's got there. So for kind of your standard rectangle type shooting area, he sure is maximizing it and he's doing a great job with it. I hope he continues. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, you know, we, um, for those of you who don't know this, you know, I'd been a match director for oh, seven years in the PRS and back here a couple of years ago, I, I, um, you know, it was time to kind of hand it off. And we had our matches over at arena training facility over in Blakely, which is an amazing facility. Uh, but we brought them over to Eric's range out there in Swainsboro at Cool Acres. And he is, I'll tell you what, that guy, you know, Eric, for those of you who don't know, um, Eric's, I think maybe in his mid sixties, he's a concrete guy. So he, he does that for a living. He's probably one of the most hardest working individuals I've ever met in my life. He, you know, he does not respect the requirement for eight hours of sleep every night. I can tell you that the dude just is a, is a machine and he has put so much time and effort into that range down there. He's got all the right equipment. He's got, he has got a skid steer with a four street head on it. You know, he's got a big bucket. He's got a big tractor. I mean, he's got everything that you need to really enhance a range and he really is doing a good job with it. But, um, and thank you. Thank both of you guys for, you know, for acknowledging that that's going to mean a lot to Eric and, you know, he, he certainly is, um, you know, he's really changed that facility down there, but so this, you know, this, so this match and it's kind of a, a little bit of a trend that we've seen here, um, this year and towards the end of last year is the scoring was conducted on an app called ultimate ballistics. And it's a, I think ultimate has been around for a number of years now, but, um, the unique aspect about the scoring system is that it's live. You know, provided that the the tablets or the smartphones that are used by the the, you know, the stage managers to keep track of scores have access to the internet. Uh, when you know when a shooter is when they're when they've done shooting the stage, uh, it will be immediately uh, visible online. So both as a as a as a competitor and as a um, you know someone who's keeping track of the match, you know you can a lot of the times real time to see how the match is running. So, and the first match this year I shot was the one day over at Alabama and I didn't, you know, I didn't, it didn't just, you know, I didn't sink in that I could actually, Oh, like, Hey, Hey, how am I doing this? You know, this match. And so I turned it on after about seven stages and I'm like, Oh, wow. I'm actually, I'm in tied for the lead here, you know? So it was kind of interesting just kind of seeing that how that kind of played out. But for you guys, did either one of you kind of keep track of where things were during the match as far as where your standings were? Andy, let's hear from you first. So I was used to seeing the Ultimate Ballistics. Um, we had been using it at several events, including the Worlds, when my daughter shot in Italy this past year. So um, it's something that I'm kind of – used to seeing around and and the ag cup i think did it right where not to say that these guys did it wrong but i prefer if we're gonna run live scoring the way the ag cup did it was they used ultimate ballistics but then they used like your average hit percentage to rack the shooters so versus at a lot of these matches that try to run ultimate ballistics they just run the standard, like, you know, if Kale's got 80 points and Andy's got 74, Kale's in the lead, but it doesn't take into account the fact that I haven't shot the last stage yet. So the cool thing about the way the AG Cup did it was if Kale's shooting, you know, let's say 80% and Andy's shooting 80.5%, then it's showing who's actually in the lead based on hit percentage. And it works a lot better. It's very similar to how a lot of the, you know, higher level shooters do when we talk to each other, like, Hey, who's down, you know, I'm down three, what you got and you're down four or whatever, you know? So we're looking at basically hit percentage on, on the small end there. I like it that way. Um, when it's done via overall score, I don't really pay any attention to it. Um, not that I, I don't really look at scores a whole lot anyway, but, um, I do kind of just, Every now and then, you know, like if we're at an event that's running live scoring, I kind of like to see how somebody else shot a stage if I haven't shot it yet, just so I kind of know what's possible. And for me, that kind of drives me to, like, make sure I'm not missing something. Like, if I'm looking at a stage and I'm like, that's probably an 80% stage, but then I see somebody else shot it and, you know, they only dropped one. Well, that doesn't really put any more pressure on me to shoot it better. I'm only going to shoot it with my process, but 
what it does do is shows me that it's possible. So like if, if you give me the ability and you say that it's possible, like, I, you know, I'm there, I'm, I'm in. So uh, anyway, that's the only thing I really use it for, to be honest. And Gail, how about you, buddy? Uh, so I 100% agree with what Andy said about the uh, AG Cup setup and the way they ran it. Um, he's spot on. Like this one, this one almost reminded me of like a two-day match where they run 20 stages at once with like 12 rounders here, eight rounders there. We're like points are all over the place. You can't really get an idea of who's actually where. And then the next thing you know, you're trying to do, you know, like calculus and stuff to try and figure out who's where. And in reality, I think that's just not productive effort you know what i mean like the most important the most important points you're worried about should be the next ones you're trying to earn so i think in a lot of ways looking at the uh, scores for things isn't conducive now that being said i think it's a step forward because i know uspsa and a lot of other action shooting sports have been using live scoring for years and they use practice scoring but what they do is they update it every stage so like some of our pistol shooters, like, you know, if they're, you know, Jacob or Aaron are going up, they can look at the live scoring as soon as they're done and see how they did, how it's stacking up to other guys and kind of where that puts them. Um, I know some people really enjoy that. Like, like Morgan King, I'm pretty sure is partially autistic because he knows probably about half the field and what their score is and who dropped what and this and that. And, um, you know, more power to him. I don't function well that way personally. So I don't put a lot of thought into it, but I do, you know, PRS maybe isn't the best spectator sport. And if we want this sport to flourish and kind of go to that next level, you got to kind of add some more drama or maybe some more kind of excitement to it. So I think that live scoring makes sense. Uh, it does. Yeah. I know Chrissy Hembree's kind of taking care of a lot of that around this area too. And I was at the match you were at, you know, and I appreciate her showing up and doing that. I think it's cool. I, I really do. Um, more than anything, I think on the one days, the fact that you can use a phone app and they just give you a code or a QR to scan. So you can just do it off your phone rather than fooling around with tablets. I thought that was a big W. So for like smaller club matches that want to get off their feet instead of having to invest in extra equipment and technology to do that. They can just, everyone has a phone in their pocket all the time. You know, everyone has a computer on them. They can just use that one. So I think that's a big upside of it. But um, yeah, as far as the live scoring, who got what kind of, and he was hitting it there where he was talking about, you know, not paying attention to who got what score, but more so like the stage average or median. Um, I think sometimes that can be important for expectation management, for sure. Uh, I've also seen it work the other way, though, where you look at it and there's quite a few cleans and you're like, man, the stage I just shot, like, I don't see a clean there. There's no way. And then you kind of get into what time of the day people shot it and this and that. So, again, like, you know, there's kind of too many nuances in there. So I think I was just going to stick with not paying any attention to it and just kind of worried about my own shooting. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it's a, you know, it's a relatively new, I mean, I think uh, I've probably seen more one- and two-day matches this year use it than I have last year. Of course, the AG Cup and the Worlds were using it, but, you know, it's still, it's still relatively new um, as far as the, you know, the match director knowing how to use it. Uh, I'm quite sure that, you know, you made some great points as far as, you know, like how the setup is and where it shows the ranking. Is it based on percentage or actually total number of impacts? And I'm sure that'll you know, all the mass directors will kind of pick up on that and I'm sure that'll change moving forward, but it's a, it's a pretty cool app. Um, but so, and what actually what I did, uh, I went on uh, tonight before we got together and this is pretty interesting data that I was able to, to kind of take a look at here. And I'm not sure if you guys have looked at this yourself or even if you do look at it, but what I did is I took a look at what each one of you guys did on each stage and just kind of look to see if there were some commonalities on some stages where maybe both of you guys struggled, if it was consistent, uh, you know, just kind of looking at some of that comparative data. And here, here are a couple of things that, that I found. Um, let's see, on an overall, Andy, uh, you cleaned 16 of 20 stages, and Kale, you cleaned 12 of 20. All right. Uh, which, you know, when you kind of look at the at the breakdown of the scoring. So, Andy, you had um, on stage number three, which was on actually on Sunday, you dropped two points on the piano keys. You dropped four shots and then your 
your you drop one other shot on uh on the fork and you drop five on the, the groovy tee which you know so your your drops were in, in a greater quantity but on much fewer stages right uh kale you know you you know again you clean 12 out of 20 so you know like on you know you drop three on your first stage of the day on sunday um you drop one on the second, then you clean the next eight. And then you, as you mentioned earlier on day number one, you know, you had, you know, you like the stage 14, you drop one stage 16, you drop three, one, one, one. So, you know, you, so, and so the question to both you guys, and Kale, I'll let you answer this one first. I mean, do you ever go back at a match and kind of look at that to see for a method of improvement, like how you did on, like how you did on the total sum of the stages, how many you cleaned, how many you didn't. So like when I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, you know, you had like, you drop one here, you drop two there, you drop one here, you drop three there. You know, does that kind of help? Does that help you or give you any data from a evaluation standpoint moving forward and like what you may need to be working on? It does. So I don't necessarily pay attention to like the stages and how I drop them. I pay attention to how many shots I drop per match and I categorize them on why I missed. So most things that I put into, I put into four different categories. Um, one of them is mental mistakes, which I would venture to say most shooters that are consistently in that top three, um, that number is normally zero. Like guys are pretty good. Like Andy is big on fundamentals and harping on a process. Like if you're doing that, there's no reason you should be making mental mistakes. Um, the next category that I have is wind, which if I'm missing shots on wind, I really don't get too upset about it because it happens, right? You know, that's a, some, that's something that you can work on and train through. Um, the next category I normally put things into is like a wobble or a stability issue, right? Like, was it me? And I'll put, you can grip anything into that natural point of aim, wobbly this, bad choice on stuff, whatever you want to call it, stage planning. But I kind of lump that all together. And then the next one I'll do is dope. And the only reason I give dope its own category is I struggled with that um, my first year and on understanding how to use a ballistic solver perfectly. And I think at the level uh, a lot of people are at, shots are not sure Andy will agree with me on this one. Like shots on elevation are completely unacceptable. Like you can't have those. Like you've got to have a perfect system with stuff like that. So um, to answer your question, Phil, I will lump into things on why I missed. I don't really get into the individual stages and what type of stage got me. Um, but I will say my scores from the first day were like, it was like drop one, drop one, drop one, drop one. Uh, what that tells me is I was being sloppy. You know, because if you're able to be 90% on stages like that and you're consistently slipping one, especially when several of those were incredibly cleanable and then other stages that were you know much more difficult i was still dropping one what that tells me is i think that's a me thing and i definitely diagnosed that the first day where i needed to kind of pull my head out of it um but the two you know day two when i dropped three on that first day it's like it is what it is I mean, the wind picked up quite a bit in that morning. I think in the morning we were dealing with a lot of kind of gusts coming on and letting off, and I couldn't see a first miss. I made a guess on the second shot based off information that I couldn't see. I was wrong again, went to my kind of tertiary plan and got it. So, like, am I upset about it? Like, sure, obviously that's not ideal, but, you know, like, I can explain it, so I don't really spend too much time on it. Yeah. Andy, so when you – and I, so, well, first question is, did you look at that, at your stage performance and recognizing that, I mean, clean, look, cleaning 16 out of 20 stages is pretty darn strong. I mean, like that is an excellent performance, you know, but did you then go back and kind of look at the downside to it that you, you had some big drops on, you know, two, four and five, which, you know, is, is not like you, but I mean, did you kind of, did you look at that after the match to kind of, try and gain some understanding or some, you know, some evaluation on why that happened or what you could do to maybe improve that moving forward. So I think while that's a great question, I'm going to, I'm actually going to redirect the question a little bit, if that's okay. <laughs> um, I think the better takeaway is that that stage that I dropped five, 
I immediately went to the zero line and fixed my zero. And there's not a lot of shooters that have the experience to know that, hey, something's not right. And if I allow this to carry for the next stage, I have no chance of winning. So instead of just, well, maybe it was me and going to the next stage, I went directly to the zero line as soon as, I mean, my chamber flag barely came out of the gun and went back in, you know, like it was the way that the venue set up, you can just go over and, and check your zero. So uh, I would love to know why my zero shifted, but I had a, I had a two tenths zero shift there. And the reason that it cost me so many points and, and this was my fault and I'll own it. But the wind was definitely coming from the right, and like you could feel it, you could see it in the mirage, and to get points on that stage, I had to dial left into my gun, and it just it was not the condition that you could see or feel, and it was it was not the real condition, and so basically what happened is it went hit hit miss miss miss, and then I hit hit again, so now I'm at four points and then I missed another one I think and then I was like oh okay this I really do need left here to, to fix it and then hit the last two or whatever so anyway I hit the last the little target on on the last run through but the point is like um you know number one definitely would be good to identify why that zero shifted, whether that's a poor quality optic or, you know, if it's a uh, shift in bore condition due to fouling or, you know, whatever, whatever your mount loose, you know, whatever that ends up being. But unfortunately I wasn't able to put any tangible fix on that gun other than to just fix the zero and go on about my day. So, um, to answer your question, other than that stage, I only dropped one other point all day and I felt like I shot a perfect match. You know, it, it was, you know, if I went through Kale's four different categories there, there wasn't a lot there. I mean, you know, you, like you said, there were 16 stages that I was able to, to get through, um, effectively. And then there were two that I dropped either two or one. So, you know, one stage I dropped two and one stage I dropped one. And then on the piano keys, man, I, I just don't know what I could have done better there. And I have evaluated that a little bit, but I think at that venue, man, like it, whatever stage you get to in the time that the Mirage is up, it's just hard, you know? And, and we just, it was a 800 yard, like one MOA wide target. And it was off of uh, some tank traps, you know, and, and, it, it's just not an easy stage. So dropping three there or four or whatever it was, um, it was a 12 round stage. So I think I timed out for one, maybe I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but I think I may have timed out for one and missed three. And uh, that was definitely the harder, the hardest stage in my opinion on that day. Um, but I don't know that it was a drop four hard stage. I think it was more of like the conditions made it really hard to um, the wind was a little up and down and the Mirage was doing some weird stuff. And admittedly, I don't shoot in Mirage as much as I'm sure Kale does being from Georgia. So, I mean, he, he just shot better on that than I did. I, I'd, I'd love to figure that one out. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. So the, the big takeaway for me was if for anybody listening to this is, like if your rifle has been shooting well and you have an expectation of where the bullet should go and the data you're getting from your bullets going down range doesn't make sense. Like go check your zero first thing. Yeah. Well, I got that's, I mean, that's a, um, I, well, I mean, what I, what I took a look at is, so I mean, okay, so let's kind of walk through that. So you got done with the stage. Obviously you weren't happy with it. And, if the wind's coming from the right and you've got to hold left, you know something's off, and most likely in the windage, which you verified when you confirmed on zero. So you made your two tenths adjustment back to zero. I'm sure reconfirm that. And then after that, you, you know, or like you'd mentioned, you went clean, clean. You drop one, clean, clean, clean. I mean, so you were able to obviously recover from that well in the you know the 
you know, I mean, let's, I mean, as a shooter, you know, when you, sometimes you have a zero shift, it's always kind of in the back of your mind a little bit, like, you know, so did you, were you paying a little bit more attention? I know, well, I don't know if that's a good question or not, but I'll ask it anyway. Were you paying a little bit more attention about where your bullet was going left and right on the target based on where you were aiming, where you think you should be aiming, and if it was still tracking and potentially seeing any of that zero shift tendency? Or did you just, once you reconfirm zero, you just ran with it and obviously shot well the rest of the day? I mean, how, how did you, you know, how were you able to put that behind you and, and be very successful in finishing out the day? So I think one of the most important things we can do as a shooter is treat every bullet like a sensor. And if you have a baseline and you ask yourself, what does the data that I'm getting from that sensor mean? And then does that make sense? And then how do I apply that to the next target? Um, that to me is, is very much the recipe for success in the wind. And I wish I had caught it a little faster on the TYL stage, but unfortunately when you, when you have like the bigger targets don't have any reaction. So it's hard to tell exactly where you hit on the bigger targets. And then so meaning like the target is fixed. So they just swing straight back. You know, they don't, they don't twist. Um, so it, I don't know. I don't want to beat myself up over that stage, but I feel like it had it been on a different stage and I saw, let's say I held two tenths right and it went right where my crosshair was, but I'm still seeing Mirage and I'm still seeing the, uh, you know, vegetation move. And I even picked my head up out of the glass and looked around at the wind flags on the different people's tripods. Like I did everything right there and it just, it was just a, an equipment problem. And to me, that was the, that's the takeaway is like, at what point do you, um, at what point should you just move forward with the data you're getting? Like to me, that should be immediately. But when I, when I know that the data, that there's two data points, right? There's the bullet and then everything else. And everything else was saying that I needed right wind and it had been working all day. Like everything I had seen and, and like you just get into this different mental state where you just recognize things faster than maybe you do other times. And anyway, long story short, um, yeah, I, I think, I think the biggest takeaway is just you, you understand what the bullet should do. And then when you don't see that, happen like number one you have to immediately just correct for what the bullet's doing because that's what matters but then if you have any question at all just go check it well okay i'll ask both you guys this so okay so real quick right I, yeah, yeah go ahead i, I don't want i don't want to cut you off but i actually had a question for andy if you don't mind yeah so andy in, in that situation you dealt with because i've Anybody that says they haven't had a zero shift in a match yet or something along those lines, maybe just hasn't shot enough of them. Um, so in that situation where you have a zero shift, you make a correction the rest of the match, like it's it obviously worked out great for you. Um, do you ever like go back home or do you have like a home zero range? Like I'm assuming it's probably big river for you. Like, do you test that again and see like, did it go? Cause sometimes you'll kind of see it where it's actually a shift where it'll go and then find its way back eventually. Um, do you kind of keep note of that? Or like, what was like your process after that? Because normally I'm sure we're the same in this sense where like the why kills you. You're damn near losing sleep over it. Like what, how, like, you know, I got, this is bedded. This is torqued. Mm -hmm. Everything's perfect. We're 800 rounds deep on this. Like this shouldn't happen, you know? Um, I would just kind of curious, like after that happens, like do you take it back to your zero range, kind of really keep an eye on what, just kind of curious what you do after that. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing that I always try to do and like Keith Baker, like I, I got to thank him for this. Cause he, he's been a big part of some of the, some of the like post match stuff for me is like just hanging out with him and he's really smart on a lot of that stuff, but, um, Good dude. Save, saving enough rounds to where you can, shoot the rifle like everybody wants to when they're done with the match they just want to be done with the match but saving enough rounds to where and having the discipline to walk back over to the zero line 
and shoot a couple rounds for speed and zero. Um, and then that way, because the problem I've had in the past, Kale, is I have went home and checked my zero, but then I wonder, well, did it get bumped on the way home? So at least I know what it was at the end of the match. And then I'll check it again when I get home. I actually have a, a zero range here at the house. So I, um, I'll go out and just check it. And then that way there's less room for me to, like you said, drive myself crazy about it. So even if it's different when I get home, I'm like, okay, well, at least I know what it was at the end of the match. And it wasn't just a windage thing. Like it wasn't because the wind was, was up or down or whatever. Um, but I wish I could tell you, I found this one. I didn't. Yeah. It just shifted. I feel your pain. Yeah. Yeah. That can be frustrating. We've all had it. I mean, and the, and you're and the maddening part of it is you're right. is like when you can't explain it, you know, I mean, especially when it's something that doesn't happen on a regular basis. I mean, you know, we've all had optics and other situations where, you know, you have more repetitive, you know, zero shifts and typically in windage, and then you change an optic or whatever, and it goes away and you're like, aha, okay, there you go. But it can be a little frustrating when you can't find it. But so in this, you know, in a, in a lot of matches, when something like that happens, the match directors are, whether it's just the kindness the in their heart or they're, they're shooters and they want to be able to themselves verify zero or there happens to be a, a zero target close by, they'll let you go and reconfirm zero. Not all match directors and or facilities give you that ability. So, Andy, in that, in that case right there, if you're at a match location where one of those two scenarios, like you didn't have the ability to confirm zero and you had just seen what you had seen, how would you handle that for the next stage? I hope I don't open a can of worms for myself here. Um, all right. So one of the things that happened at the 2023 finale or two finale, I guess it would have been two finale because we're in four now. Anyway, um, the 2022 finale, I missed 31 shots on day one. <laughs> and I hate to even say that out loud. Um, but it was it was absolutely a gun issue. Like, I don't know what it was. Um, I ended up changing some components and changing how I do some stuff. And, and that seems to have worked itself out, but I borrowed a rifle and missed three shots on day two. So at that point, it was a learning moment for me in that if I had had another rifle in the truck, that was perfect. I could have just went to the truck after the first inkling of a problem and grabbed another rifle. So the PRS rules are written in a way that says that you can't swap back and forth between guns unless there's a mechanical issue. In my opinion, accuracy is mechanical. So if I have a gun that I have any question in the mechanical accuracy of the rifle, I, I, I now carry two perfect guns to the match. And it has been instrumental in my mental game, my confidence level, the knowing that I could just go grab that other gun. And I've only done it like once or twice since then, but I have done it and have finished in the top five after changing guns. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those things that if I have that ability, uh, that's what I would do is just go to the truck and get another gun. Now, if, if I flew to a match, I'm only going to have one gun with me. Right. So, what I would do at that point is I would put the data into the Kestrel and I would say, okay, this is what I expect. And then part of shooting with shooters you trust is if you're shooting with two good shooters and you're like, I know our dope always lines up. We went to the zero range together. We went to the, the tune up day together and you're at four tenths. I'm at four tenths. We verified that before we left. Well, now every stage for the last three stages, I've needed five mile an hour and you've needed seven. Somebody's off here, but at least you can work back into those numbers and apply them to the next stage. I got you. Yeah. Gail, how would you handle a situation like that? If, if let's say you're up at, at well, I'm not going to use the match director's name, but you're at a match director or a match stage location or a match location where you could not confirm zero and you just saw something on that last stage you just shot that was making you question if there may be something mechanical off with your zero on your rifle how would you handle that 
So that happened for me at the AG Cup day three. That's exactly what happened. So I I was confident enough in myself in that first stage. And I feel like it's a like an earned confidence, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm, you know, it may sound arrogant, but like I work too hard and I put too much time behind a gun and too much training to say, like, oh, that was me, that was me, that was me. Sometimes it is, but if it does, I'll be the first to own up to it. But when you do everything right and you break that shot and you see where it lands, it's like like Andy was saying, you need to be able to say something's wrong. And the first stage of the AG Cup, day three, I, like you can actually hear me say it on camera, it was after the third shot. I said, something's wrong. Because I'm looking at the targets, I'm looking at everything that I could see, and I'm like, something's not right. Um, and again, you know, not to agree with everything Andy says here, but, you know, we're on a trend. Um, when you're gone... In, in the sport we shoot, you know, I hear people say all the time, well, if your gun shoots a minute, it's good enough. Um, that's BS. That's absolute BS. I mean, we, when you, the people that say a minute gun is good enough, in my opinion, haven't shot enough 100 yard dot drills. Because you start shooting 100 yard dot drills, shoot a 100 yard dot drill with a minute gun and let me know how your next, you know, therapy visit goes because you're going to need it. <laughs> um, so, like, you need a good gun. And, mm -hmm. like he's saying, your gun's shot out or whatever the situation is when it starts shooting that bad. Yeah. It's my kid. Like it's done. It's toast. So the way the AG cup worked, um, you kind of shot a clump of stages on day three because of the SDZs and the way the lanes were firing and they stopped traffic. You'd shoot the first couple of stages and then they'd open it back up. Everyone would migrate to the next section. So unfortunately I had to shoot that next section or I had to shoot that same section with that gun. I didn't have the opportunity to grab another gun because I wasn't parked in that same location. Um, and I knew something was wrong and I tried to kind of rationalize, okay, like, where did I miss? And I missed left on almost every shot. So I was like, okay, like, let's make an assumption that I'm a target with left. Like, we'll just stick with that. So the next stage was a longer range stage and it was full size E types, um, which I think this is one of these things where like, you know, you really have to, and to come back to your question, what would I have done the next stage if I wasn't able to zero? Like long range shooting, the way I see it, it's, it's all kind of a gamble, right? And you're hedging your bets. So if I take my min and max on my wind and I put that in tenths of a mils and I see how large my target is in tenths of a mils, it's just betting at that point. I want to hedge my bets and put as much of that gap on the target as possible. So if my min and max is four tenths, right essentially from my minimum win to my maximum and i'm shooting on a half mil target in reality like there's no reason i should miss because i got an extra tenth of coverage you know what i'm saying so in that situation if i wasn't able to zero and like i did at the ag cup that day everyone on big targets always shoots for the center they're scared to kind of play an edge i see this a lot with coyote targets when you have a target that you know it's maybe not that forgiving and vertical but I mean, it's over a mil wide. People will be like, you know, they're, oh, I'm going to hold two tenths right. And they're just seeing the same beat up spot everybody else is. It's like, well, have a little bit of kind of balls and take it to maybe the clearer white spots and see exactly where you're hitting. And so on the E types, that's what I did. It was fairly beat up here. So I took two tenths out of my dope, knowing it was really gracious on vertical. And I took it to the bottom white clean spot and I favored right intentionally knowing that I was missing left prior. And I'm like, if I hit the same spot and fully type that everybody else is, I'm not going to be able to see Jack. But if I go to that clean white spot, I can see where I'm hitting and make that correction. And um, sure enough, I barely clipped the left edge on my first shot. So luckily I got away with a pretty good score, which I talked to people after and they're like, we well, bombed the first one, but the next stage wasn't that bad. It's like, yeah, I had to do a lot of things to make that stage come together that I shouldn't have been doing. You know what I mean? It wasn't as black and white as it seems, but like Andy was saying, um, two perfect guns. I can't agree more. When people say, oh, I have a backup in the car, um, I never refer to that gun as a backup. They're both main guns. They're both perfect. You know, and um, a big thing, like he was saying, bouncing stuff off shooters you trust. Like, man, if I go to a zero board and the sun's in our face and it's kind of right at that like one o'clock coming up over a berm and it's right on your objective and you know you zero and I'm like a tenth or two left of what I normally am and I lean over and it's somebody you know it's if 
if I'm shooting with Nate or Gossett or you crew. So somebody I trust, I'm like, Hey man, was your zero left? They're like, yep, sure was. I'm like, cool. I'll put it in the truck. Like I know my gun's perfect. I know that's probably a lighting condition or something affecting it. Like I'll put it away because there's people I trust that are seeing that same environmental phenomenon. Yeah. Cool. Well, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about the, um, about Sunday uh, and the skill stage, because so obviously the skill stage, you know, played into the, who brought home the first place trophy. Right. So uh, Andy, it looks like you shot the skill stage right after you dropped four on the piano uh, key tank trap. Right. All right. So yep. you, you probably had a pretty, pretty good inkling that you were right near the top um, when you got to that skill stage and that, that, you know, the time on that may impact who brings home the trophy. Right. So you, and you shot it. What was your time on that skill stage? Do you remember? 50 something. I don't and remember. I think, yeah. And I think, yeah, I think you were in the, in the low fifties and Kale, you were right around 60, maybe. I know Andy having about 12 seconds, 12 seconds. I know right. that because I heard it from about 15 people after the match. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. well, so Andy, when you went up to that stage, did you feel as though that you needed to maybe hustle a little bit more or is that just your normal cadence on a skill stage? Is that just normally how you shoot it? So there was a time, I can't remember exactly what match it was, but I ended up pretty much where Kale's at. Like I lost a match by time. Um, and I came home and did a lot of like self-reflection and trying to figure out like what I could do to ensure that I at least gave it my best effort that that wouldn't happen again. And, um, I will say this, like, I don't change how I shoot for anybody. So I don't think that I changed anything when I went from, you know, the, like I said, the one that we, you know, the piano keys, it was, it was towards the end of the day, the mirage was high and it wasn't like I made a conscious decision to shoot differently. It was, I know how to do this correctly. And I rehearsed that in my mind as many times as I could before the, before the buzzer went off and basically it was just get the footwork right and, and run the process correctly. Like I know how to make a good shot and I know how to, to move efficiently. And I just wanted to make sure that I had those mental rehearsals in and I, and I had like the, I knew what that felt like and I needed to remember what that felt like to go from, position to position correctly. So I wouldn't say that I, I shot it any differently than I ever did before. It was just that I shot it consistently and that that shooting it in the way that I did was how I had practiced it. And it just worked. Okay. And that's how you know that your training works is you end up shooting as good or better in game day than you do in practice. Yeah. Gail, how about you, buddy? Um, so I, I, I would say I'm a slightly above average shooter as far as speed goes. Um, but as far as the skill stage goes and that one in particular, um, I had, sh when I shot that kind of like throughout the day, I feel you, I really felt like I hadn't like caught a groove yet that match. Like, I really felt like I was having to be very consciously competent to make all of my impacts and to see everything that I needed to. And I mean, I'm sure Andy knows this, obviously cleaning 16 out of 20 stages. Like when you kind of catch that groove and you're where you need to be and you're in your flow state and you're unconsciously competent, like you don't have to work for it. And I felt like when I shot the skill stage, I wasn't at that point. And I was like, I need to see every shot and exactly where it hits. And, um, I was shooting with a teammate, former teammate, Scott, Scott Peterson, he's retiring. And, uh, you know, he has the hen salt. So, I mean, he can see everything. He can see what my next shot's going to be. You know what I mean? The guy can see the future with that thing. So 
And I asked him, I was like, Hey, like, I want to be very conscious about where I'm hitting. And he's really good about that kind of backing you up. So um, I try to call every shot and make micro corrections. And sometimes those plates on T post will lie to you. You know, you get a hard whip left or something like that. And in reality, you're hitting dead center. And I knew that before going into it, but I was like, it's fine. I don't care. I want to see every shot. So I did slow it down um, a little bit, but to be honest with you, like I've heard a lot of people say it points are first for sure. But I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, this is, that, that was Andy's match. He won it. He beat me on the tiebreaker. There's been a golden bullet won by a tiebreaker. So it's not like we both won the match. Andy won the match. That's how this sport works. And that's okay. And to be honest with you, like the way I shot day one, um, I'm okay with it. You know what I mean? It is what it is. Like, I understand you kind of have to be responsible for your actions sometimes. And I was responsible for my shooting day one. Like, you know, you suck. You got to reap the repercussions. So, you know, when he, I, like I had talked to some people after and they were like, Oh, you should have just been a little faster. And I'm like, for what to potentially pitch one in the dirt. You know what I mean? Like I know, I know what a top level shooter can shoot. We talk about it sometimes, right? People are like, Oh, well, how'd you shoot? And you're like, Oh, I shot good. You kind of keep it close to your chest. Cause you can't tell people the truth. Cause the truth would have been a lot of expletives and me MFing how I shot and stuff. And, you know, in reality, you're still ahead of a lot of people, but I knew, what Andy was capable of shooting and where I was at. And when I saw scores after and I saw that like the KYL, it made sense to me because I honestly figured Andy was still a couple points ahead of me. So at that point, I figured I was gunning for points, not placement. So yeah, because that was your fourth stage of day two and you would yeah uh, drop three in your first stage and one on the second. And then so you know you you were probably like like you say more focused on on exactly good trigger pulls and impacts. And and you did. Because, you know, you claim the stage before that and then skill stage and then every stage after that for the rest of the day. Um, so I've got two questions real quick for Kale. So, sure. or for both of you guys, actually, I mean, both of your high level competitors um, on ties. I've been trying to think of a way and I'm not saying this is the way, but I almost wish that you could get like a decimal point for the win. So. <laughs> like if you won, you get like a hundred point five or whatever. Um, just so that it's almost like if you do win, there's no benefit to it if somebody ties you points wise. Um, and the 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 decimals would only come into play. Let's say it was like you got a point two, and you're only getting three hundreds. So even if you got ties on all three of those and you won the tiebreaker, you'd only have a hundred point six. But in the case of, um, like in the rimfire finale, I won the rimfire finale this past year, and I won two of the matches that I shot, but I won the tiebreaker at the finale. Well, I ended up losing the season by like .02 or something like that. And it's like, or I don't know what the exact numbers were, but it's like, if you had gotten anything for winning the match versus just getting the same score as the second place guy, I kind of feel like you should get a little bone for winning the tiebreaker in score. If you know what I mean. I I a hundred percent agree. Like, and sitting in the seat of somebody that doesn't benefit from saying that after this match, I a hundred percent agree with you. Um, and to give a solution to that, I really feel like the PRS needs to move to the old NRL scoring. So that's what they did for the IPRF team. Uh, this past team was where essentially it rewards it rewards you for doing well. It rewards you for showing up to highly populated matches. It kind of rewards you where it should. So essentially 50% of your match placement, right? So if it's out of 100 points, half of that is going to come from your hit percentage and how you placed so in that 50%, Andy and I both would have had 50 and 50, if that makes sense. The next half of the scoring is going to come off how you placed. So in that instance, because there was 120 shooters, right? Andy would have got that 100%, and then I would have been second of 120. So whatever of second of 120 would be, that would have been the other half of my score. And I really feel like in places where like you shoot like um like 
best in Texas, right? You know, I love Prentice and I talk to him all the time. So, you know, he knows I'm going to badmouth him before I do it. But like in a match like his, where 50th place is still getting 90%, right? Like that's not reflective of like, you know, VPRC. Like VPRC, you know, and I hate to keep agreeing with Andy because I really don't like him that much to agree with him as often, many times as I have this podcast. But, you know, uh, VPRC is a very, very good course of fire. Probably one of the best I've shot. In essence of like not having long range stages, you have long range targets. In essence of shooting things out of order the way you think, I like all of it. I think, you know, that difficulty is good. But that being said, you're not going to go to VPRC and be in 50th place and have 90%. It's not going to happen, mm-hmm. right? Like you're going to have a fifth place trophy and probably have like 93-ish, 94, something like that maybe. But that scoring would reflect that because although you got 93% in your scoring, you also took fourth or fifth overall out of 150 or 200 people. Whereas those people at Shot Best in Texas, it's like, okay, you got your 90 out of 100 for your hit percentage, but you also took 50th place out of 200 people. So it pulls you back in that sense. So it basically kind of rewards you and kicks you where it should. Um, And I think we need to move to something like that because, I mean, not all wins are created equal. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's some of those matches where you show up to, like there was a match last year. I don't remember what it was and I'm not trying to throw like individual shade, but I think there was like 60 something people at a two day PRS match. And it met the minimum requirements of points counted. Like, you can't tell me that's the same as, like, a 200-person match at, like, Punisher or K&M or Corner DPRC. That's not the same win. Um, so I, I agree with Andy. I think there should be some type of scoring disparity to separate that. Like, I don't think that at this match, like, Andy shot better than I did. He won, right? Like, he should get something for that other than just a trophy that says one, not two. There should be something for the season, I think. Well, you know, so got one other. yeah, go ahead, Andy. Go ahead. Um, so I've got one other thing to go along with that. Uh, this weekend at VPRC, we ran a skill stage each day, and we mashed the two together, and basically it was your average of a skill stage over two days. So on day one, we ran the big small at 400, so the 8-inch and the 6-inch with 10 posi- with ten shots and five positions on the barricade, so the, the standard PRS skill stage. And then on day two, we ran the other skill stage where you do 400 and 500 with both 8-inch plates. Um, so what y'all's opinion on that were, like, in this case, Kale maybe – maybe would have been in a groove on one day and I wouldn't have, and it maybe would have shaken out differently. Phil, you got this one. Well, you know, you're talking about as far as like the outcome of the match. Yeah. Like, do you think having a skill stage each day is more reflective of the shooter's skill? If it's a two day match and we're in a pro series, that's why I decided to do it as a match director. But I was just curious of as shooters, what is y'all's thoughts on, should we move to a, a, a setup where each day there's a mandatory skill stage? Well, I think you probably have to look at the data. I mean, like, you know, I, I, you know, Francis won the match and I, I remember looking at his time, it was like a minute and eight or something. I, I, it seemed like a big difference between his time and the, and the other top finishers in the match. Like his time was, it wasn't a little bit faster. It was a lot faster for those two. And that makes sense now why his time was a minute and eight, which so his two skills put together. But um, it'd be one of those things that you probably want to take a look at. Okay, so like what we're talking about here with having two people get the same score and get the same PRS points, right? So how often did that happen three or four years ago? Rarely. I don't, I, I'd be hard-pressed to remember a single time that happened. But it seems to be happening a lot more. I know last year there was a match, I think the – out there in Rattan, where they had three shooters with the same score. So you had three shooters that got 100s out of it. So it's becoming, you know, as the competition is becoming, you know, more pronounced when you're in all these top-level shooters, two of which you're, I'm having the podcast with tonight, two of the best shooters in the country, you have all these really great shooters that that have, and, and the scoring percentages, like, you know, so you, you guys got 193 out of 202 shots. So you dropped nine shots over a two-day match in very difficult conditions in small targets. 
I mean, like you got to find more separators to be able at the end of the year when you're going to the finale to be able to really distinguish like, okay, so Kale, okay, let's just say you win three matches and you tie every one of them and you get second in every match. And Andy, you win, you win three matches and you tie in three of them and you get first in every one of them, right? At the end of the year, you guys are, you come down to the last stage and you're on different parts of the range and Kale, you shoot a little gimme stage of 400 yard, you know, one MOA targets and, and Andy, you shoot the 1400 yard stage. Well, you know, like you, you need to find ways to really be able to kind of make that separation. And I think, and I don't know if Ken is looking at that. I know he's probably got a lot on his plate right now. You know, there were some discussions a couple of years ago about revising the scoring method, Kale, something along your lines there. Um, but I think that moving forward, that probably will get looked at and probably will need to, you know, just because like this year, I mean, like that same weekend, that both you guys got a hundreds at the match out in California. I think the sharpshooter match out there, I think they had two shooters that had the same score. So in the same weekend, you had four one hundreds. So, you know, they're, they're going to, they'll, they'll do something or they should do something, but how they, you know, I guess that's where Ken gets to, you know, kind of figure out what he wants to do. It's his game right now. So, Hopefully he'll get feedback from the match directors, which he's done a good job of so far, and we'll come up with a good system. But, but you're right. I think that this that's is crazy. So four one hundreds. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So the the match in California was a tie as well. Yeah, uh, they're Corson Piper, and I can't remember the other fellow's name. He's an, <laughs> he's an MDT shooter. Um, yeah, both those guys. They both ended up the same score and same situation you know Corson ended up with second place trophy but they both got 100s so yeah that's crazy so now you've got four wins where there should only be two in the prs points that's that's actually pretty um uh, yeah that that kind of solidifies the point there a little bit i think absolutely yeah, it does. And uh yeah, and look, and it's you know, it's, it's you know, this discussions like this that will get more attention and kind of get that ball rolling. I think um, with um, you know within the PRS and the match directors and and with uh, Ken Wheeler. So hopefully something will come out of it. But you know, I mean, I don't know. In one sense, you kind of look at you look at the other side of it. Man, it sure does make the finale exciting. You know, when you've got five or six shooters that all have a hundreds and it's and it's a tight you know finale. You know, that's that's exciting. Um, but you still need to find a way to maybe have a higher level of reward for the person who actually brought home the first place trophy rather than just getting a one or a two, right? So well, cool. Well, well, I'll tell you what, I wanna um I wanna I wanna kind of go over two things before we get done here. And I and I want to commend both of you. So this match, I had some back problems, I couldn't shoot it, right? Um, so I was spectating and and you know, just I was glued to the, you know, ultimate ballistics app. You know, I, you, you dive deep enough into it. You can kind of see where everybody's at, regardless of what it shows on the leaderboard. You can go to each stage and see, you know, how many, how many you've got left and what you got coming up and kind of see where things stand. So what I saw was there coming in the end that you guys were tied with, um, with like two or three stages left. Uh, Kale, you had, your last stage was very difficult. You know, I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was off the NPA barricade. Uh, Andy, your second to last stage was the pipe stack, pipe stacker, which was a very difficult stage. I mean, I know when, you know, Kale, when your squad shot that, I think there were there, both of you guys cleaned it, but Kale and you, you know, you had really good shooters in your squad. And I think Keith maybe dropped four or five on it. And, you know, there were some big drops on it. And Andy, you shot it in a very difficult time of the day with, with targets that, you know, that especially that back target there on that 600 yard berm is, is known to have a lot of mirage. And so I'm sitting there looking at the scores on Ultimate Ballistics. I see both of you guys coming up on that stage. Andy, I went over there and actually watched you shoot that stage. And I was just blown away that it was at that moment, there at the end of that match, with a probably one of the harder stages of that day, that you cleaned it. I mean, like, that just says a lot about your ability to stay in the moment, one shot at a time, and one of the reasons why you won the match. And, Kale, you know, I, whether you knew it or not, um, you know, you, you needed to clean that last stage in order to tie Andy. Andy's last stage was probably the easiest stage of the match, which I think was off the gates 
and it was a really big target out there. Um, so had a pretty strong feeling that Andy was going to clean that. So both of you guys right there at the end of the match needed to do what you did in order to, well, come away with a hundred PRS points, but that was very impressive. I mean, so, you know, Kale, I mean, did you, did you know going into that last stage that you needed to do that in order to, to tie Andy? No, I didn't know. You didn't know Andy? Did no, you? No, I, I had a feeling like based off people's, and you walk by and people are like, oh, keep it up or this or that or whatever. And, you know, I mean, you also too, like you, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of top level guys are probably the same. We're like, you can really gauge off how you're shooting. Like you understand, like if you're on a heater and how you feel, or man, I let one too many go, or man, I don't know if that was good enough. Like you have an idea of where you're at. Um, like I, I mean, I knew I shot very strong day two, but I also knew the deficit that I was in at a Southeastern match. So, you know, it's like, wasn't expecting miracles there, but I knew I shot well and somebody would have to do. There was a couple names at the top after day one that I didn't really expect to stay there, you know, and I don't mean that condescendingly. I just, you know, objectively looking at them, I knew they weren't going to last, but like, you know, I look at Andy's score and I was like, well, I'm sure I'll see him up top tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, it's not going to go anywhere. So, no, I didn't I didn't look at it, but I had a feeling that, you know, things were getting narrow at the top. Andy, how about you, buddy? When you got to that, uh, the pipe sacker stage, did you kind of have a feeling that you, I mean, you, you knew, um, you had to know it was a difficult stage and it was a 12-shot stage. I mean, did you kind of feel, did you feel the moment? I think the benefit of having, I haven't went back and looked but I think the last time I looked at my PRS profile, it said that I had shot like 62 day matches or something like that. And I, and I think that one of the major benefits of being at that point in your career is that it just doesn't matter. Like I have been in matches where I look back and I said, you know, if I had cleaned that stage, I would have won the match. And I've been at matches where I've been like, you know, if I hadn't cleaned that stage, I wouldn't have won the match. So you can only do what you and God allow, you know, like I just, I, I think sometimes it's just your day or it's not. And I've kind of come to peace with that. And if you give me enough opportunities, I'm going to keep putting wins on the board, but today might not be mine. You know, it just, I mean, I think Kale can, can probably feel the same way. It's like, you know, you can only do what, what it's, it's your time to do. And, and like, I just, I went up there and executed the process. I felt like I was seeing the bullet well. I felt like I was I was manipulating the trigger well. Um, you know, fundamentally I felt really solid. I I didn't I didn't make any mistakes and I didn't have any reason to make any mistakes. Like I was not in I was not in a bad headspace. Um people had made comments like, you know, you need this one or whatever, but like it doesn't to me that I need everyone I, like at, you know, you just, you get you after you've shot enough matches, you understand that, well, if you miss one, you're probably not in the first place position anymore. And if you miss another one, you're probably going to be in third. So let's just run that process correctly. And we don't have to worry about that shit, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's kind of where I was at with it. I didn't know exactly the scoring though, to answer your question. Well, I think uh, for, you know, for the, for the viewers and, and listeners to this podcast and, and, you know, one takeaway, that I think um, hopefully they'll get with, from both Andy and Kale uh, is that they, they're not letting the moment get to them to the point where it's taken away from their method of shooting the stage, you know, and I've, we've all seen it, you know, Kale, you even mentioned it, some names that typically aren't at the top that they were after the day one, and they may not have the experience level to stay there on day two, you know, because they too much going on in their head, too many thoughts, too many things other than, you know, the plan, the process, the next shot and staying in the moment. Right. And I think that's, that's something that I see is different with like you guys that I see from a lot of other shooters is they, you know, they, they're finishing near the top and never at the top. And it's just, I think they, they get caught up in, it's like if you're playing golf and you birdie the first three holes, they're like, Oh, I'm going to shoot a 68 today. And then you end up shooting a 75 because you thought about the end rather than the next shot. And so that that's something that I think that you guys certainly have achieved in the sport. I've watched both of you shoot before. I've shot with both of you before. 
And I think that's something that a lot of people should just kind of, you know, don't think about the big picture. Don't think about where you're going to finish. Just kind of stay in the moment, get your, get your game plan together and shoot every stage the way that you want to shoot it. Right. So. Yeah. I, it always cracks me up. on like, I mean, how many times have you looked back at the scoreboard or practice score when you get done and you're like, Oh, if I just had one more point, you know, if you're at K&M, right. If you have one more point, you move like 25 places or something, <laughs> but like, you know, it's like you look back at those scores sometimes and it's like, I don't think people respect all points the same they'll shoot certain stages where it's a meatball and kind of maybe not respect the target the way they should. And then they shoot a super difficult stage and all of a sudden they're hundred percent tunnel vision focus. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, guys, it's binary. It's ones and zeros. All points mean the same. So at the end of the day, there's not like that point, no one point matter than any other point, the entire match. It's just people don't have the foresight sometime in the beginning to treat it that way. I think. Yeah, I agree. Well, good deal. Okay, guys. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Um, Andy, I'll defer to you here. Uh, anything you'd like to say here at the end of the episode? Anybody you'd like to thank or any final comments? If we can take just a few seconds, I've got to know what's the secret to KYLs. You kick my ass on them every time. I need. I got to. I got to have the inside scoop, Kale. What's the secret? <laughs> Oh shit. I don't know. Pay the match director before it starts and get a good draw. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. That probably wouldn't go well with work. Um, no, man, I, I don't know. You win some, you lose some. I'll be honest. Like you, when you're talking about dropping, you know, three or four or whatever it was on the piano key stage, that's a super missable stage. Like I was talking with somebody about that stage. It was like, if you drop two or three here, you probably still shot perfect. It's just, what, what are you going to do about it? You know what I mean? Like you have those hang times with those certain targets, but um, I do shoot steel close a lot because we're down here in Georgia. I shoot a lot of 300 yard stuff. And so if I had a stronger shoot, that's it. But I definitely have some weaknesses in areas that you're probably stronger than just due to range limitations and stuff out here. So, you know, it is what it is, man. You know? So you were saying something in a podcast I was listening to and I was trying to track what you were saying. So, the wind will carry the target image down range in the mirage. Is that true? Yeah, it can. Like essentially like the target image, the origin of the target is going to be wherever the wind's blowing from. So if it's like a, you know, half mile an hour to like two mile an hour towards almost a boil floating, it's probably going to be like that low left or low right, depending on where the wind's coming from. And then, you know, if you have like a two to four ish mile an hour, where it's not enough to keep that mirage cruising, but it is moving it. Like I've absolutely seen it where you need a mile an hour or two extra into the mirage, because in reality you're shooting at a target that's not necessarily there. And I'm sure you're referring to that frontline one. I've seen that just because, I mean, where we shoot down here, like if you shoot over my hay field in July or August, like, like I've heard people all the time talk about like, oh yeah, one one minute targets, you know, that's a pretty good sized target. I'm like, you're full of shit. You shoot a one minute target at my range in July and that thing is going to look like it's about a tenth and a half big, you know? So that mirage makes things significantly more <laughs> difficult. And I got some good advice when I first moved here from Ben Gossett. And he said, he said, don't avoid the mirage. So like a lot of people down here will shoot like morning or dusk. So they get optimal conditions. He's like, don't be afraid of it. Like, just kind of deal with it, you know? So, um, because he works in our uh, custom firearm shop, he shoots a lot on lunchtime. So I shot with him quite a bit, you know, when I first got here at lunch and, you know, lunch in the middle of Georgia in the summer, like it's miserable. Um, so you kind of deal with it a little bit and you learn some things. You learn some things that, you know, kind of that believe the bullet you were talking about, man, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like the Joe Dirt pause attraction rear end on the Plymouth. Like it just does. Like, why did my bullet hit there? Why did that happen? I don't know. It just does. Like, just believe it sometimes, but don't make a mechanical change or get into your kestrel and start messing with things you shouldn't. That's for sure. Right. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, shout out. Uh, I, obviously, all of my sponsors, thank you so much for all of the support you give to me. Uh, MDT, Defiance Actions, Geisley Barrels, um, Peterson Brass, 
Uh, I hate doing this because I'm always going to forget somebody, and I'm really sorry. War Rifles, Ice Rifles, Keith Baker and Drew, you guys are both awesome. Um, and then um, First Light gave me some gear. It's pretty sweet. It's not, not bad stuff. Um, and then, you know, just like I thank God that I'm able to do what we're doing because – only a few years ago, I was working a stupid job that I hated, and here we are now. So it's a whole lot more fun than than working on a truck. So anyway, um, that's all I got. Dale? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Andy's train wreck on the TYO, because if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have fallen back enough that we could share this together. So thank you for that. <laughs> no. No, in all seriousness, uh, thanks to Andy. This was his W. He won the match outright. That's why he has first place trophy. So thanks for sharing the time with me. I appreciate the conversation, honestly. Uh, don't think it's often that, you know, you get guys that are winning together and you kind of like, you know, let the veil down, just talk shop. You know, what did you do? What did you learn? Like, I mean, anybody that ever thinks they have this sport figured out, I'm sure is not winning anymore. You know, everyone that I know that's still winning all openly admits that they got work to do, that they're still a student. And so I think that attitude is a super positive thing to keep. So I enjoyed the conversation and I, I mean, I picked up, I always take notes. So, you know, I picked up a few notes and stuff too. I mean, I think we're always trying to learn and get better. Um, but as far as shout outs, thank you to the U.S. taxpayers out there for keeping me afloat. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks to the Army Marksmanship Unit for all they do for me. And again, thank you, Phil. Um, I think this podcast is a unique opportunity. I know I said it a couple of times talking to you prior, but for new guys getting in the sport, I don't think they understand how fortunate they are and how many, if you're willing to spend the time and you got to commute and you want to sit through these podcasts, man, there's so many breadcrumbs out there and little things that you can pick up on to accelerate your growth in this sport. It's not even funny. Yeah. I mean, look, admittedly, part of the reason why I do this is so I can become a better shooter. Right. And but also feel that there's, you know, it's a forum that we can all get together and and kind of give some guidance and direction and little tidbits of information to newer shooters to help them hit more targets, stay more engaged in the sport, you know, get their buddies involved in it and grow the sport. So that's uh, it's, it's a, certainly a good, good, good thing that I think we're all doing. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us tonight in this this unique format. I think it went pretty well. Um and, uh, you know, based on how many ties we've had, we may do this again here sometime soon. So you just never know. We've got kind of a little trend going here and ties in, in two-day PRS matches. So, uh, but tonight went well. Uh, guys, again, congratulations on your 100 points. And Andy on the victory and, and Kale on the second place. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is episode four of season two on the Winner's Circle. My name is Phil Cashin. Masterpiece Arms is a sponsor. And thank you guys for watching.